Now, open theism. Let's consider that view as well. This view, as I mentioned, is one that has more uh, bearing. It has more traction amongst evangelicals, self-professing evangelicals at times. And it has been one that is, I think, a, a huge detriment to the life of the church. Um, and I'm going to give you some of the critiques as we go, but let me present to you some of the main tenets of their view, and then we'll look at some of the critiques. Open theists include folks such as Greg Boyd, William Hasker, Clark Pinnock, um, John Sanders has a God Who Risks book that is very uh, influential, very thick explanation of this view. Open theists make strong claims that their views are biblical. Now that's an interesting difference from process theism. They seek to argue from Scripture. They affirm that God created the universe from nothing. Rather than evolution, there was some pre-existent matter. The appeal of the view, like why does this view have any traction? Well, because they are preserving libertarian freedom, as they see it. You, a human being can always do other than what you do. And they're seeking to get God off the hook for any connection whatsoever to evil. Greg Boyd famously tells a story of a woman missionary who had been overseas with her husband. And tragically, the woman's husband was unfaithful to her while they were overseas. Um, when the woman returned home devastated, and Boyd was one of her pastors at the church that had sent her out, she came to him in his office and told what had happened to Boyd, her pastor, and she says, why did God call me to the mission field just to allow this to happen? And this was Boyd's response. I'm so sorry. God was just as surprised as you about that event. Now you see, that's meant to be comforting. God did not know the future. God did not know that was going to happen. God is in no way implicated by the harm and the suffering that this woman had gone through because God was just as surprised as you. Is that comforting to you? I don't think it actually should be, but we'll continue with just presenting the view for now. God is omniscient, according to this view, but He cannot know the future. God knows all actual events, past and present. For God to possess omniscient foreknowledge would require that God knows exactly what I will choose with every decision I face. But if God knows what I will choose, then I can't choose something different than what God has always known I would choose without God's knowledge being wrong. Therefore, it would deny human freedom for God to know the future. That's their argument. Humans have libertarian free will. God has given free will to humans for good, and it is not God's fault that humans choose to use it for evil. William Hasker argues this way, One is free only if one would be able, under exactly the same circumstances, to refrain from the act that one has in fact chosen and to do something else instead. So you see that libertarian freedom. Hasker, with the analogy I gave you of sitting in a locked classroom, even if you loved being in that classroom, if there were a chain on the door, you're not free to go out if you wanted to, so you're not free in Hasker's view. As a result, since the future is genuinely open, it is not possible for God to have exact knowledge of the future. It is not logically possible for God to know the future with certainty, for this would deny human freedom. God has limited His own knowledge of the future to allow for human freedom. He limits His sovereignty. He limits His knowledge as well. Therefore, God cannot have exhaustive foreknowledge, and God is not in control. So God, as we mentioned then, is temporal. He is bound in time. God is sometimes surprised and learns things. And as I mentioned, they argue for their view from Scripture. So let's take a couple of examples. When Abraham starts to offer Isaac on the altar and God stops him, God says in Genesis 22:12, Now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now I know. And they say, so God did not know beforehand. But my critique would be the word no, Hebrew yada, has many connotations. Why can it not mean proven by experience? Scripture uses anthropomorphic language to describe how God relates to creatures. Remember our category of analogical language. It's a phenomenological thing. God has now seen it proven in what he knew already to be the case that Abraham would do. Now I know. God changes his mind when new circumstances arise, they argue. Genesis 6.6, they appeal to this verse, The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. Regret, niham. The critique is, though, God is not actually changing his mind. The word regret or relent, Hebrew, niham, 
is phenomenological language, meaning it seeks to account for the way God relates personally to the situation in less than univocal or precise terms. If we understand some of God's warnings as an impetus to turn and walk in the right direction, as we mentioned before with the ship and Saul, uh, Paul on the ship and the warning, don't let anybody get off the ship because as long as we heed that warning, God's going to preserve everyone's life. If you understand it that way, then we can make sense of when God brings disaster after warning of it or when he doesn't. The warning was the impetus, the means by which God was accomplishing his final outcome that he had always planned and known would happen. God is omnicompetent, they also claim. He's temporal bound in time. He doesn't know the future, though he's omniscient. He's also omnicompetent. Like a master chess player, God can make very good guesses at what decisions will be made. God is like a parent that has observed a child previously in a similar situation such that he can, with a high degree of accuracy, predict the future. God is infinitely resourceful and can intervene in the world's affairs. God prevented what he could prevent and permits all that happens. That is, if God doesn't know the future and he's simply responding to what humans do, he can at any time step in and seek to relieve the situation by acting in a way that changes what's going on. But then we have the question, if that's the way God interacts with the world, why, as he saw the Third Reich and Hitler building up to it, the height of its power, did he not at some point go ahead and intervene? It's very interesting. There are several critiques of open theism. and. For probably the best well-known and most helpful critique, I present to you this book, um, Dr. Bruce Ware, God's Lesser Glory. I'm going to read to you from it in just a second. But several of the critiques would include these. It denies affirmations of God's foreknowledge from Scripture. It denies affirmations of Scripture of God's control and working in the world um, beforehand and planning and sovereignly ruling over creation. It denies God's wisdom and ability not only to predict the future, like think of future predictive prophecy in the Old Testament, but then his ability to bring it about. It casts doubt on our ability to trust God with our futures since the future is out of God's hands and God literally doesn't know it yet. It leads to the notion that God makes his plans to interact with the world based upon our choices. It's not that God has a plan that he's working out and then he's bringing our choices in line with his plan and his ultimate aims. Rather, God waits to see what we do. And so, for example, you see God is on plan B. God didn't know that creation would fall, but that happened. And then God had to establish a plan to redeem it by sending Christ. Prayer would be informing God of our wishes and asking God to get in line with our plans. This view requires that God is able to get things wrong. Um, I've mentioned Hitler already, but God was wrong apparently about what Hitler was going to do or else God would have intervened, presumably. It implies that we would only pray for God to act in a way that doesn't internally influence someone's will because that would be violating free will and which would be unloving if we had prayed something like, God, change my sister's heart, change my mother's heart, help them to believe in you, open their eyes, soften their heart. That would deny um, God's love. You're asking God to deny his own love when you pray like that, according to open theist. You could not trust God's guidance to be what is actually best for you because God doesn't know how it will turn out for you. As with the case of this woman, God called her to be a missionary, not knowing what was going to happen when she got there. It leads to despair in suffering. I want to read you a section uh, just briefly here of what Joseph's situation must have been like if you presume all the assumptions of open theism. And it allowing, that is, that there is senseless acts of evil that occur in the created world. Joseph might reason, I am a victim of all this pointless evil and revengeful plotting of my brothers and now the false accusations of Potiphar's wife. Even the dreams God gave me about my brothers, dreams he meant to be an encouragement to me, have actually contributed to their hatred of me and thus to my increased suffering. God didn't mean to do this, but the fact is that he has made my life immeasurably worse. And the dreams, oh, imagine my brothers bowing down before me. How absurd. The dreams were wrong anyway. Furthermore, God did not even know this was going to happen to me, and he is totally unable to control these horrible events or to do anything about it. After all, free agents have done these things to me, and God cannot know in advance what they will do, and he certainly cannot control their actions. 
And all I can do is accept the fact that this pointless suffering has been directed at me and that it has now ruined my life. Yes, I'm glad to know that God is with me in this prison, but how I got here, when and if ever I may get out, and whether there is any purpose served for it are all beyond God's control. Woe is me. If you take the assumptions of open theism, it leads to despair in suffering. I think we have much better models for possibilities on how God relates to the world. The next views are views within the broad spectrum of evangelicalism to those we turn.